What's up, Meta Nerds? So I was super excited when I got to pick up the Visual Dictionary book, and I went with a breakdown of the Wayfinders first. But Eckert Slatter went with this name first, so if you want to check out his take on it, I put a link in the description. If you did see his video, be sure to stick around because I was able to find even more details, where it mentions Naga Sadal, explains the new Darth Tannis, and show the meaning behind choosing these names specifically. What these Sith Lords all have in common that Darth Sidious admired, why he chose them in particular, and point out the meaning behind not including some of the more obvious Sith, like Darth Bane and his own master Darth Plagueis. On the Exegol page we see three landmarks pointed out, and one of them is named the Sadao Escarpment. An escarpment is like the sign of a plateau, and it is named after Naga Sadao. This is the very first time that this ancient and incredibly important legend Sith Lord is mentioned in canon. Revenant was already put into the new mobile game, Galaxy of Heroes, so people were already kinda saying that he was canon. I never take those games to have any serious implications though. But then there was the Jedi Crusader pendant that contained a Sith lightsaber crystal in Episode 8, which many people thought implied the existence of Revan. But now for sure we get a name drop in canon. I should point out that of course with all these Sith Lords mentioned, it is just a name so far. But honestly, new canon hasn't done a lot to drastically alter the characters that are being brought in from Legends. Thrawn is the best example of this, which though they change some details, it really is true to his overall character. I don't think anybody could be disappointed in the portrayal of canon Thrawn, and so we can expect that the general background story that I'll give on each of these Sith will stay very similar. Naga Sadao was a master of Sith alchemy, using his skills to create terrifying beasts and was responsible for growing the Empire to a greater size than ever before. Also, he was originally from Zyost, which is now also canon, at least in name but it's how he ruled this empire that gives us the first clue at what they all had in common that Sidious admired. Much of Sadao's fighting was done from isolation in his Sith meditation sphere, where he could conjure up phantom beasts and even phantom ships in order to terrify his enemies. It's kind of funny to point out that Palpatine too would spend a lot of time ruling his empire from within a large sphere, the Death Star. It's kind of a joke, but in all seriousness, it was the fact that Sadao utilized fear to rule and was smart enough not to put himself on the battlefront all the time that Sidious really respected. He also moved to a remote world, where slaves followed his absolute rule and built his temples, so Sadao could lay in waiting, studying the Force. This was on Yavin 4, but we can see some similarities with Sidious's move to Exegol, with all those strange Sith cultists under his command. Undeadu was actually already name-dropped in the canon comic Return to Vader's Castle, too, but his Legends title should let you know right away why Sidious loved this guy. Referred to as the Immortal God King of Prakith, he was the one that figured out the skill of Essence Transfer, the thing which made him immortal, and what was part of Palpatine's ultimate goal here on Exegol. I go really deep into this in a documentary-length video on cloning history with clips from both the Plagueis and Bane audiobooks, but this skill and even the title of Darth come from Andedu. He too had a Sith cult following that had built him temples and waited for his return. Also, he was the first in a long line of Sith Masters that were betrayed by their apprentice. Another thing the two could probably bond over. Darth Phobos doesn't have that much of an epic backstory, but again, some poignant similarities. She was an Old Republic era Sith and had a massive and violent cult following, which she used to attack both the Sith and the Jedi. This earned her the moniker, the Hidden Fear, and this standing outside of these normal two factions is something that Sidious shared. Don't get me wrong, he definitely loved his Sith culture, but he rejected many of its tenets, and I've always felt that Sidious sees himself as one of one. At the core, not really a member of this or that faction, just Palpatine who is able to do anything and everything to make himself more powerful. Darth Desilus and Darth Revan are both Old Republic Sith who were once Jedi. Desilus led his followers and killed over 2,000 Jedi Knights. Revan would eventually turn back to the light, but for a time he fought with a Sith Empire that was one of the greatest the galaxy would ever see. I believe Sidious knew that Revan's immense power came from delving deeply into both the light and the dark for a time. And we see that Palpatine was willing to absorb the force from both a light side user and a dark side user. Perhaps he admired how Revan had such deep understanding and mastery over both sides of the force. And then there is this short mention of a new ancient Sith Lord, Darth Tannis. This is who developed the kyber weaponry used on Malachor. It kind of implies that he may be the first to ever use kyber crystals in a super weapon, and so you know he had to make Palpatine's list. The guy who made two enormous Death Stars back to back, both running off a of kyber crystal technology. And so if you take the wisdom of all of these ancient Sith Lords together, you get a pretty cool picture. Sidious saw that he must rule through fear, be plotting in the shadows and having others put their lives on the line for you, who need to create a kyber-powered superweapon. But then when the time was right, he must also perform the essence transfer. If not into a willing vessel, he would have to absorb the life force of one who had fallen to the dark, and one who was still in the light. Mastery of Sith cultists, superweapons, both sides of the force, and the practice of essence transfer were all essential to this plan. 
and that's why these names stand out to him amongst all the Sith Lords. But don't worry, I didn't forget about Darth Tenebris. From him, Palpatine would appreciate his mastery of biology. The entire Bith culture ran off of highly refined eugenics, and Tenebris simply took this even further, combined with his deep understanding of midichlorians, maxichlorians, and Sith philosophy. He actually eugenically created Darth Plagueis. This is often an overlooked part of the amazing Darth Plagueis book, but this Sith Mune whose common name was Higo Damask was birthed by a dark acolyte trained by Darth Tenebris. Tenebris was going around secretly testing Munes to find out who could be the best genetic match to produce a highly Force-sensitive child. He had his Mune Sith Acolyte seduce Kar Damask and give birth to the child that would come to take the name Darth Plagueis. In the Plagueis book, we see that Sidious never really respected Plagueis. He simply used him to learn about some specifics, but always knew that his own power in the Force was far greater, and disdained the fact that this Mune seriously thought that Palpatine was too dumb to see that Plagueis was just hoping that Palpatine would be his puppet ruler. That's why I said earlier that the Sith Lords that are not mentioned tell us a lot too. How is his own master not on the list, but the master of his master is? How is Darth Bane not on the list? I think he found Bane's rule of two to be foolish. Plagueis knew that he was starting to lose control when Sidious started training Maul. Then he started grooming Dooku. And so of course, when he eventually becomes Emperor, there were all kinds of Inquisitors and other dark side users. The entirety of the galaxy's dark side energy was not just put into two vessels. One to embody the power, the other to crave it, as Bane so famously prescribed. It's much more clear by the expanded universe material in the novel, and perhaps now hinted at by the snub in this canon book, that he thought Plagueis was just a fool as well. A weak immune who went mad trying to study midichlorians instead of essence transfers, who would be pathetically killed by his apprentice. As for these two names, Hask and Hans Adul, it is unclear what these are. From all the research I've done, they seem like completely new creations. So that's it for the new canon Sith and all the name dropping of these legend Sith, and I really wanted to show the things that they all had in common how Sidious learned from each of them, and even how it showed the Sith Lords he had less respect for. But what do you think of all of this? Were there any connections that I missed, or do you think that there's another meaning to the names that are chosen? And the only thing I want to add that was oddly missing was a reference to Tenebrae, slash Vitiate, slash Valkorion, as he's the most like Palpatine, having the longest ruling Sith Empire, and doing it by maintaining so many successful essence transfers. The only reason I would guess that you wouldn't mention him is because in a lot of ways his EU powers and accomplishments outshine Palpatine. And rightfully, Palps always has to be the most powerful on screen. I've always been open to the idea that they could be the same spirit, slash both were true embodiments of the dark side itself, but I digress. Let me know what you think. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, never fall asleep with a Sith in the room, and the Force will be with you, always.